Well, I was one of those first generations of kids to grow up in front of a TV set. And the things that really attracted me were science fiction and, and fantasy and horror films. And, and I was fascinated by the monsters and the aliens. And, and I just thought, wouldn't that be a cool job to have, you know? So when I was about 10 years old, I decided that I wanted to be the guy who made the monsters for the movies. <laughs> Designing aliens for men in black, you do a different thing than you would if you were designing aliens for Alien, for example. On the first film, I, I kind of kept saying to Barry, is this a comedy, is it what, you know, and we were all kind of trying to figure out what men in black really was going to be. You know, it's so much easier on the second film because we now, now we have that blueprint of the first film. Hey, get some booties on them things, you're crapping up the floor. We didn't want to do cartoon aliens but they had to be funny, you know, and they had, they had to have some humor to it. And, and it took a little while to figure out what that is. So it was just a tricky balance of trying to balance that kind of fun feeling and a reality to it and make it look like something that really could exist but isn't, isn't really frightening. First of all, we get a script, which at least gets you starting to think about. You kind of know that you need these certain characters in certain places. I usually do most of my designs now on a computer. I still do like pretty much 2D artwork. It's been about 13 years now I've been drawing on the computer and, and really found it a, a really good way to design, especially for a film you've got not a lot of time. You can do paintings on a computer that look like a painting that you would that would take a week to do, but you could do it in half of a day. And then you can also change colors and, 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 and things and you can cut and paste. And, and the biggest problem I have with the computer stuff is all of a sudden instead of having two or three choices, you have 20 or 30 choices, and, and some of them are subtly different, you know, it's like, sometimes I even have to look at them really hard myself, to, you know, think, well, why is this one a different one, you know? But I start with that, and I also have a team of people that I work with that are designers that, that some still use pencil and paper, and some do maquettes, and then what we'll do is get Barry in a room with all the artwork up and, and say, okay, now the Jerithians or whatever, you know, which one of these you think looks most like the Jerithian, you know, and, and then he would pick that, and once he did that, then we would decide on the approach to take. All is lost! All is lost! What was fun about this Man in Black and the first one is that it's all the stuff that I've kind of been doing in, in my career, uh, I kind of all mixed up in, in one movie. You know, we have animatronic things, we have puppets, we have, you know, simple makeups, we have complex makeups, and, you know, fake heads and the whole deal. Usually when I design something, I, I, I I think of it as a makeup or as an animatronic thing to begin with. Sometimes I, I just start going and see what happens, and then I try to figure out how we're going to make it later. Uh -huh. But for example, if it's a makeup, we need an actor. The actor comes in, we take a life cast of the actor, which is like a plaster, we make a plaster of their head. And on that, sculpted in a plasticine clay, we sculpt the new features, and through a process of molding and casting and stuff, we get what we call an appliance which is a foam rubber piece that's then glued to their face. It's a use once and throw away thing. So every day they work, we need a new set of appliances. It's amazing what actors can bring to something. A number of the people who play aliens are people that I'd worked with before that I knew could wear the makeup and deal with it and actually could bring something to it as well. There's two aliens that are these bird people. There's a male and female bird. And this is something that I actually designed something like 30 years ago. I did some drawings, at least something similar. Uh, and I thought it'd be cool to do this bird kind of person. And I worked with two actors on The Grinch who had really nice, long, thin necks. And, and I thought, they'd be great for that bird makeup if I ever do it. You know, I started out thinking I was gonna be just a makeup artist and when I was a kid, but was didn't like the limitations of that. And then I got into more of the animatronics and puppets and fake heads and stuff because you're not bound by, you know, having the two eyes here, you know. Some of the aliens in this film were, you know, we'd do a maquette and then we would make an armature and it's a complete sculpture, there's no actor involved. What's great about that is we're not inhibited by the human form inside. Uh, we can give it as many arms or as many legs or, or whatever as we want and, and stretch things out. 
for example, there's one alien we called Flapjack that has this kind of long, weird neck and big, weird stalks that kind of come out of his head, and he was completely animatronic. Big sculpture, again, make molds, make foam rubber skins, but then the whole inside of it is a big machine. We have a big machine shop, and we had a lot of, a lot of mechanical people on, on um, Men in Black that were making mechanisms for this. We had one guy that was called Shark Man who had like this shark-like head. It was still a guy in a suit, basically, with glove hands on that we made, and an animatronic mask that was full of servo motors that worked. Welcome to planet Earth. In your case, there are some rules and regulations. When I did the first Star Wars and did a lot of the aliens in the cantina scene, we hadn't seen a lot of stuff like that, where there's a whole bunch of aliens in one little deal. But ever since then, there's so many Star Trek TV series and movies that and you know, Babylon 5s and all these things where they have people in makeups and I said, it's gonna be hard to do something that hasn't been done a thousand times already. You know, at one point in my career that was much easier, but so many things, and I, and I have people that I've taught who have taught people and, and they all kind of are, are, are doing things the way I would have done it, you know, and I've seen makeups that look like I designed it that somebody else did that I once trained, you know. And, so it's going to be hard, you know, and, and, and I think we actually have some of this that, that are kind of unique looking. You don't look too good. And you look like crap. <laughs> <laughs> I take that back. He looked like crap. <laughs> In the old days, I would do everything myself, basically, because there wasn't anybody else that was as good as I was. I did my first, God, I don't know how many films, I, I, leaving in my parents' house, and my bedroom was my makeup lab. Earlier in my career, when, I, when the job started getting bigger, I had more of a crew, and I just knew that the, the job was too big. I couldn't do it myself, so I had to give it up to somebody. It was a hard adjustment to get used to having other people doing the work for you. Now, I just love the fact that I can hire people that are better at th than I am at things to, to make my work even better. We had quite a few people here because of the time frame. I think it was close to 100 people during, during pre-production at one point. And I've got a you know, whole assortment of incredibly talented and, and really nice people. You know, I've, I've a lot of great sculptors and great mold makers. I mean, you need so many different people to do this kind of stuff. You know, there's, and every step is very, very important. Foam rubber technicians, uh, Roland Blancafleur, who's my foam guy, is, is amazing. He makes the rubber like nobody else. Mechanical guys that do the mechanisms. We have people that do costume parts and, and people like, is it one of the kind of thankless jobs are like the seam cleaners. The uh, pieces, when they come out of a mold, have a seam on them and the, and the seam destroys the reality when you see an alien with a big seam running down it. So there are people who basically spend their day in the dark. We have a dark part of the shop that we keep dark and they just have like one light source so you can see the seam better and they, you know, cut it off and fill it in and it takes days to do this. I kind of really try to find people that are not only really good at what they do but really have a love for what they do. Many times people ask me, what's the new material that made the big advancements? I know like when American Werewolf came out, people said, what, you know, why is this so much better? There must be some new materials and stuff. And I said, not really. It was, the reason is, is that we were given more time and more money. I mean, money is the real material there. I started out with a little bunch of independent films that were shot in 10 days, and I would get a few hundred dollars and, and, and a week or two if I was lucky. You know, you can only do so much, but films like the Exorcist, you know, like Star Wars and these kind of films, when they started becoming blockbusters and they started finding out that if they gave somebody like me a little more time and a little more money, everybody's life would be easier and it would work better and the stuff was cooler. Frankenstein was the film that, more than anything, is the one that I credit for making me want to do this, to, to make monsters and, 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 and makeups. That whole concept of creating life, you know, uh, it's kind of very much what we do. I mean, not that we really create real life and we don't sew cadavers together, but what I love about what I do is you'll have something that's just an idea in your head and sometimes it's not a real clear idea. And you know that in a matter of months, that you're gonna see that idea in front of you looking alive, you know, looking alive on film anyways. And, and it really is like creating this life. It's such a cool thing, you know, to know that what you're doing, you know, you know is, is gonna look like a living, breathing creature.